engaging with the community since 1970. This is WIS Awareness with Billie Jean Shaw, a Black History Month special. Happy Sunday to you and welcome into another episode of Awareness. I'm your host, Billie Jean Shaw. In honor of Black History Month, all month long here on Awareness, we are celebrating Black History Makers all across the Midlands. Kicking off our series this week, it's a man who you've invited in your home for over the last three decades. We're talking about sports director Rick Henry. Now we know Rick for his award winning sports coverage, but did you know this about him? He is living black history. In 1981, Rick Henry became the first black sports director for a South Carolina television station. And it is an honor to welcome him on awareness today. Hey, Rick. Hey, thank you, Billie Jean. And thanks for inviting me on the show. Yes, yes, yes. You know, I think it's amazing your, your career, your journey. I want you to tell our viewers where your beginning started in MACB, South Carolina, <laughs> and how that played a part into the successful sports broadcaster that you are today. Well, when I was growing up, I loved sports. I loved reading about sports, playing sports. I played uh, football and basketball, and I uh, just loved baseball as well. And when I was, uh, well, after I finished uh, eighth grade, uh, my mother told me I was going to go to summer school and repeat eighth grade English. Mm -hmm. And I was shocked because I'd made an A. But she knew my eighth grade English teacher had not properly prepared me for high school. Mm -hmm. So I went to summer school, retook eighth grade English, made another A. And it was during that time I discovered I had a knack for writing. And I got to thinking, well, let's see, writing, sports, and I thought, hey, maybe I can make a living being a sportscaster. Yeah, and so in 1981, you became the first black sports director at a South Carolina television station uh, where you were working at WPDE in Florence. Right, WPDE in Florence. They hired me. I didn't have any experience working in TV. Mm -hmm. I did have a broadcast journalism degree from the University of South Carolina. I was uh, named an outstanding senior at USC, which is very prestigious because it's a small number of people yeah. in a rather large university. And I'd worked in radio for a while and worked for Chesterfield County in the tax assessor's office mm -hmm. and as CETA director. And uh, I decided, hey, let's give uh, TV another shot because I had <laughs> applied for just uh, jobs with just about every TV station in South Carolina and was rejected. Wow, including I know you've shared here at WIS, WIS right? WIS, yeah. <laughs> Look at that, a full circle moment. But Rick, in 1981 when you became sports director, did you realize in that moment what you were doing for those who were going to be coming after you in the sports broadcasting world? Not at that time mm -hmm. because I was so focused, Billie Jean, on just getting a job. Yeah. All I wanted was an opportunity. And Jerry Condra, the general manager at WPDE at the time, mm -hmm. when he hired me, I told him, you, were, you wouldn't be sorry. And so I just poured myself into that job, just worked very hard. And so it didn't hit me until later yeah. that I'd become the uh, first black sports director in South Carolina. And since then, um, yeah, you know, I, I wear that distinction proudly. Growing up in the rural South, experiencing just segregation and then for you to be a black history maker as one of the first black anything in this state. How did that later impact you? Well, growing up in the 60s in the segregated South, and I remember how the family would get excited any time a black person was on TV, mm -hmm. you know, be it an entertainer on one of the uh, national shows or if you would happen to see uh, someone black on one of the local talk show, so to speak. Yeah. But you never saw any black people anchoring or reporting. And so I, I think about that and also just to get that opportunity. And I had some struggles too, like when I was working in Florence yeah. and your NASCAR coverage is very important because of the Darlington Raceway. Mm -hmm. And I noticed one day that the other station in Florence, they had been over to the racetrack they had some drivers in testing, and like I knew nothing about it. You know, this is before Twitter and stuff. So I called up the uh, track public relations director and I said, hey, I see you had some drivers in. Uh, next time you have something like that, could you let me know, give me a call? Yeah. So it happened again. And I'm like, man, you know, I, this is awful. But I had 
uh, a couple of white friends who lived over in Darlington, and they started calling me whenever they would hear the engines because the engines would just reverberate all throughout the town. Wow. So one day they called me and they said, hey, Rick, something's happening at the track. So put my gear in the car, drove to the track, and get there, and I'm pulling my gear out, and I could see the look of astonishment, you know, on everyone else's face. Yeah. Well, and I think they realized at this point that I wouldn't be denied. So then the P track PR director, he would call me. Wow. And, and what year I, was this, Rick? Oh, it was in the, it was in the 80s. It was in the 80s. This was <laughs> happening in the 80s. Oh, yeah, early 1980s. Wow. And so, you know, I worked really hard, and um, I, I became rather good at it, right? Mm-hmm. So good that after I came here to WIS, they called me up one day from the track and they said, hey, Rick, we'd love you to be the um, uh, Grand Marshal for the Southern 500 wow. Parade. And just in 2021, they had me introduce the um, players who had qualified for the playoffs because the Southern 500 was the first playoff race. And the uh, track president, Kerry Tharp, used to be the sports information director at USC. He said, hey, Rick, how would you like to introduce the playoff drivers? I said, oh, I'd l love to. And to think about how I started off covering NASCAR yeah. and where I am now. Wow. Well, we're going to pause right there on that note, Rick. Thank you so much for sharing that. When we come back, we are going to continue our conversation with sports director Rick Henry. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Thank you so much for sticking with us on Awareness. Today we are talking to Living Black History, our very own Rick Henry, who is the first black sports director for a television station in South Carolina. Uh, before the break, we were talking about your career at WPDE in Florence. This was in the early 80s. That's where you were actually named uh, sports director. And you were facing some challenges even then, even after having that title, uh, as a black man in the broadcast industry. Rick, what made you want to keep going? Because if you were being denied access to coverage and you know, feeling like you were being left out because of the color of your skin, why did you not say, this isn't for me, this is too much, I don't wanna do it? Because of all the challenges I would faced mm -hmm. in my life. I, I remember um, integration in the first year that I attended McBee High School. Mm -hmm. And the first test I took it was a science test, and the teacher's giving back the papers, and he said, hey, there was one perfect paper in the class, and it's James Henry. And my white classmates, they're looking around going, James Henry, who, who's that? You know, and it, it gave me a great deal of satisfaction when the teacher handed me my paper. Yeah. And, you know, I don't hold any um, ill will against my white classmates because, mm -hmm. you know, that's what they grew up hearing that black folks could not excel, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, in the classroom. And then I went on to become valedictorian. And um, I had people tell me that maybe you should go to a small school, you know, a small college, because you're from a small town. Wow. You know, but I wanted to go to the University of South Carolina. Then people were telling me, you know, when I told them I wanted to be a sportscaster, maybe you need to go out of state to do that. So all my life, I was hearing that. But my mother always instilled in me uh, this message. You're as good as anyone else, mm. you know. And then the lesson she taught me about eighth grade English, never to be complacent. And even when you've done your best, you can always do better. So, uh, you know, these challenges that I uh, had to face early in my career, that was nothing because I was just so overjoyed that I was getting the opportunity yeah. and nobody was going to knock me off track. I even, let me, let me tell you another story. Mm -hmm. When I was in Florence, I spoke like at a fifth grade, sixth grade graduation. And in that speech, you know, well, basically I was sharing my life and, you know, some of my challenges and the overall message was just because you're a small town, or, uh, or maybe because of the color of your skin, don't let that, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, keep you from chasing your dreams. Absolutely. Okay, and like in it, I referenced Martin Luther King, Larry Bird, even a, a Gomer Powell reference. <laughs> so when the uh, ceremony was over, I had this um, white mother come up to me and said, um, Rick, maybe next time you can say something for the white kids. 
Oh, wow. Yeah, it, someone even, uh, even called our general manager and said, you know, they wanted me fired, said we have video of the speech, you know, Rick Henry gave. So the GM <laughs> wanted to see the speech. Yeah. I gave him the speech. He said, I thought it was a great speech. Wow. You know, so, this you is know, just some of the shoulder. challenges. Yeah. And it, uh, you know, it just slides right off my back. You don't, you don't pay. It doesn't stick. It doesn't stick. <laughs> No, it doesn't, you know. And, uh, you know, sometimes I, you know, I hear stuff. Uh, you know, I can tell you about some of the uh, phone messages that uh, people left me. Like there's this one guy who used to call, and I figured out he would always call when I was on the air. Uh huh. You know, and like one day I think I picked up, and it was him. Hung up. Wow. You know, you know I call these people. You know, these uh, especially on the day of the um, internet. You know, mm -hmm. these keyboard cowboys. You know, they'll say all this stuff when they don't have to face you. Right, but what they do face is your face on TV oh. every day for over 30 years, really over 40 years if you count your entire broadcast career. You're an award-winning journalist, award-winning sports broadcaster who has covered everything from the Olympics, the, the bombings back in the 90s in Atlanta, right. mm -hmm. uh, the championship games for the Gamecocks and Clemson, what has been the highlight, though, Rick, of your career? Uh, Billy Jean, there are so many. I mean, so many, because like you said, I've covered some of the world's biggest sporting events. Mm -hmm. And it's hard for me to pick just one. Yeah, my list was very, <laughs> very <laughs> condensed. Just for time, we could take up the whole 30 minutes just talking about Rick's achievements. But it's hard to pinpoint one. Well, I have to look at my career as a whole mm -hmm. and just the fact that I've been able to do what I'm doing and to be blessed to do it for so long and I constantly think about my grandparents and my mother you know my grandparents sent all eight of their kids wow. to Mather Academy in Camden because there wasn't a black high school and might be when they were growing up and if they hadn't done that you know the the course of my life could be entirely different so I feel a closer connection to them, mm -hmm. even though they've been gone for many years, mm -hmm. and uh, also my mother. So the fact that I've, you know, I've been put in this position, I take it as a whole. Wow. And I, sometimes I think, wow. To the next upcoming black sports broadcaster out there, watching you, feeling inspired, what would you tell them? I would tell them, don't try to be anybody else. Be yourself, because you see a lot of people, they want to try to copy someone else. Mm -hmm. Be yourself, and don't let the word no affect you. You know, you'll get turned down for jobs. Uh, some people may not like your ideas, but just stay true to yourself, and just keep fighting, work hard, and be confident. Wow. Be confident. Ladies and gentlemen, the first black sports director for a television station in South Carolina, our very own Rick Henry, living black history right here in the Midlands. When we come back, much more awareness. Welcome back, everyone. Jack Daniels is the world's most popular whiskey brand, but a little known black history fact about Jack Daniels. While the face of the drink is of a white man from Tennessee, obviously named Jack, the liquor was actually created by a black slave named Nathan Nearest Green, who actually mentored Daniel for the creation of the drink that we know today. So joining us on Awareness to tell us a little bit more about it is Darren Thomas, the president of Thomas Media Group and Black Expo South. Uh, your organization actually has an upcoming event this Wednesday, yep. bourbon tasting, and also continuing to learn about the history of Jack Daniels. But Darren, welcome back to the show. We're happy to have you. Thanks for having me. So typically when we see you, we see you in the springtime as we are previewing a Black Expo, which right. we'll get to that in a few because I know that's around the corner. Um, but this event that you're holding is specifically for Black History Month. Tell us a little bit more about it, starting with the history of Jack Daniels. Well, so here's the thing. Interestingly mm -hmm. enough, Bill Jean, most people know that associated with the Taste of Black Columbia, which is part of the Black Expo weekend, we've had this long mm -hmm. uh, relationship with Jack Daniels and Brown Foreman Industries. Mm -hmm. And several years ago, Jack Daniels came to us and said, hey, we, we like what you're doing in the African-American and urban market is very important to us. So we, we, we ventured into this, this partnership unbeknownst to us. 
the real history of Jack Daniels. So when the story really broke mm -hmm. about four years ago, I will say this, Jack Daniels did, or, and Brown Foreman Industries that owns Jack Daniels did, a, did a, a, a masterful job of owning it and saying, yep, this is actually true. That's Mirror good. Green, yeah. uh, who was a slave, who was Jack Daniels' slave, taught him the process for distilling bourbon, which, mm -hmm. which it honestly was a West African water purification process, um, which was something he brought with him as most slaves who, who brought, the, you know, things that from the mother country here, here to America. Well, he taught Jack Daniels this, mm -hmm. this process, and in the, in, in the, in, during the, in the process, uh, Jack Daniels, of course, really took off with, with the brand, um, with, with his brand of, of bourbon and whiskey. And for Nearest Green, you know, the story just doesn't stop there. Mm -hmm. um, in the acknowledgement of the history of Jack Daniels, Jack Daniels, the, the company, or a Brown Foreman stepped up with the Nearest Green family to then start Uncle Nearest Bourbon. Um, what we're doing on Wednesday is a collaboration between Uncle Nearest Bourbon, which is uh, was started by the Nearest Green family, uh -huh. and Jack Daniels, because there's an initiative called the Nearest Green Jack Daniels Initiative to actually grow or um, develop more African American master distillers, getting wow. more African Americans in the process of distilling um, 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 spirits. So. With this initiative, we have the first African-American graduate of the Nearest Green Jack Daniels par um, Collaborative Partnership. His brother's by the name, his name is Byron Copeland. Okay. He will be joining us as we sample some of the, some of the new products that are coming out. We will actually select a bourbon barrel, mm -hmm. um, of which um, we will, um, uh, Jack Daniels and, 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 um, and the Uncle Nearest Project will then bottle about 200 ba uh, bottles, single barrel uh, bourbon, which will be distinctly a Black Expo bur uh, bottle. Of wow, which, that's major. Of which we will sell those bottles with the proceeds going to the USC Center for Civil Rights. Wow, look at that full circle Absolutely. moment. So um, and, and here's the thing. I, I, I've, Love to add the fact that we we asked the University of South Carolina Civil Rights Center to 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 be the beneficiary because we believe that the history and the historical aspects of our community are just as important as the economic aspects because we've got to tell that story particularly when we are in a space and time when there are others that want to rewrite or refute that mm -hmm. um, we think it's critical and uh, be, because Jack Daniels stepped out with the Nearest Green family to embrace this. We saw this as an opportunity to help us further the mission in the African-American community from an economics perspective, particularly as Jack Daniels and Nearest Green has made a committed effort to um, extend the opportunity to uh, growing, developing more African-American master distillers so that we start more brands. Yeah. And at the same time, there's a historical aspect that we get to teach not just our kids, but everyone. Before you wrap up, give us a little preview of Black Expo coming in the next few months. Uh, That's right. Starting off in March in Charleston, right? All right. In Charleston, in a few weeks, we've got Black Expo March 9th through the uh, through the 11th. Mm -hmm. Eva Marcel, uh, Lorenz Tate, uh, J. Alfonso Nicholson. We've got a stellar lineup. Great, great plans there. But then in May, May 11th through mm -hmm. the thir 13th, the Columbia Black Expo coming back for our 26th year. Well, Darren Thomas, thank you so much thank for coming you. on Awareness. We look forward to seeing you again. Absolutely. And thank you for dropping by, especially on our Black History Special, giving us a little bit more information on a little known Black History fact. Awesome. So we're gonna take a quick break. We'll be back to wrap up the show. Thank you so much for tuning in to Awareness this week. A special thank you to our guests, WIS's very own Rick Henry, who we honored this Black History Month as he became the first black sports director at any South Carolina television station back in 1981, definitely paving the way. I also want to congratulate Rick, who was inducted into the South Carolina Broadcast Association's Hall of Fame. So deserving. Congratulations, Rick. We are so proud of you. Also, a huge thank you 
you to Darren Thomas from Thomas Media Group, who's over Black Expo. Uh, he came in to share the true history, the true story behind America's most legendary whiskey, Jack Daniels. We learned today that it was a black man who is the true creator behind the liquor. Also, make sure you check out that bourbon tasting event this Wednesday, which will be hosted by Thomas Media Group and White Expo, where proceeds there will go to the USC's Civil Rights Center there. So great stuff happening this week. And next week on Awareness, we are continuing to celebrate Black History Month with uh, more little known Black History facts all around the Midlands. And we're going to preview the 18th annual Black History Parade and Festival happening in Columbia. Have a great week. See you next Sunday.